Welcome to the Wheeler Centre. Um, my name is Amita Kerfalani and I'm the project's producer here. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are here on the land of the Kulin Nation and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present and any other elders of other communities who may be here today. Um, welcome to the Wheeler Centre's series of lunchtime talks entitled You Don't Know Me. Um, don't forget to join us in two weeks' time for what's shaping up to be an incredible lecture by Jess McGuire on um, Geordie pop princess Cheryl Cole. Um, I really urge you to come along. It should be hilarious uh, and nothing like today's lecture. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, a Wheeler Centre favourite, Bernard Callio, to the stage in a moment. Um, he is, as most of you know, uh, a performer and a comic book com communicator. He makes comics, publishes comics, and teaches comics. And he's kindly left a, a huge range of his work on the table down the back there, which you may have seen. And he kindly is offering them up if you'd like to take any for free. Um, he'll also be at that back table at the conclusion of the lecture uh, to talk comics, sign comics, or with you, cuddle comics. Um, whatever you choose, I'm sure he'll be most happy. Um, as a little bit of background, uh, Bernard published the rom romance comics anthology Tango from 2007 to 2009. And with filmmaker David Hayward, he made the feature documentary Graphic Novels! Exclamation mark, Melbourne! Exclamation mark, in 2012. Um, and in 2013, Bernard, along with historian Alex McDermott, began work uh, on an ongoing project, a graphic novel uh, entitled The Devil Collects Faust in Melbourne, 1888. And that was part of a creative fellowship at the State Library of Victoria. Um, in 2015, Bernard, along with Erica Wagner and Elizabeth McFarlane, established the imprint 12 Panels Press. Uh, and, and 12 Panels published its first book in 2015, the graphic novel Salt, The Salty River. Um, please welcome Bernard today. I won't say much about the Moomins. I think we have a few fans in the audience, but perhaps no, <laughs> none bigger than Bernard. Um, and there will be a 10-minute Q&A at the conclusion of Bernard's lecture, so please do save up all your questions. Thanks, Bernard. When I was a little boy, about 40 years ago, a guide took me to the top of the hill. Now, we know these heroes' journey stories. You know that the guide is usually a, an elf or a dwarf or a wolf. In this case, the guide was my mum. She walked me up to the top of the hill on the way, getting there through the mists, if you like, I could see a large building sitting there on the brow of the hill, the top of the hill. As we got closer and closer, I recollected that down at the bottom of the hill, in a cave, in fact, in a corner of a cave, an alchemist was working, preparing lotions and potions for the good villagers of Westgarth. This alchemist was my father. So as my mother, my guide, took me to the top of the hill, I knew that my dad was down there at the bottom of the hill working magic. Selving people's ills. And now, only now, 40 years on, do I know that without the alchemist, there is no guide. We got closer and closer to the very top of the hill and the building resolved itself into this white, glowing castle. We went to the, the front bit. It was this enormous stairway up into the, you know, surely 
we would climb these stairs and we'd meet the king, the king of Westgarth. And he'd bestow boons upon us. So we climb those stairs and we open these enormous doors and um, at a desk in the centre of this big room was a, not the king, actually, as it turned out, uh, a lady who seemed really old, she was probably about 30, uh, and she had these glasses on and uh, she had this grey bun of hair. She greeted my mum like an old friend. I've never seen this person before. And what greeted me in this place, this castle, was this smell. And this smell, I'd never smelled this smell before. This smell was the smell of, well, it was the smell of paper, and it was the smell of print, and it was the smell of paperback. And it was the smell of hardback. But really, I think, this smell was the smell of pictures and words. And this smell, I I, I realise, has become, was to become and did become a, an a salve for me, like an a, a anointment for me. Like whenever, whenever I smell that smell, that's that compacted print smell, I relax. Time dilates. And if you can walk down shelves of books and just inhale them, then all is well. So... Um, the lady, the lady who greeted my mum, uh, they got on very well, and they and and uh, it was overwhelming. This 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 place. I, mean, I suppose the thing about it was it was the only time, the first time, the first time in my life where I've been to a place where the books outnumbered the anything else. The books outnumbered the building. The books outnumbered the furniture. Outnumbered in sheer weight, but also in um, presence. So, uh, and I knew, even at this point, so, you know, I'm, what am I, I'm around seven years old, I reckon, you know, I caveat, all of what I'm telling you may or may not have happened, but it is all true. <laughs> um, at this point, I'd come from a, a, a family life, so I... I, I I'm part of a large family. I'm the eldest, which means I'm special. <laughs> no, no, it means that there's a funny moment, of course, if you're the eldest, you know, where you're the old, only child and then you become not the only child. But, but more than that, it was a really good place to grow up, my family. It still is. And, um, but the rest of the world was challenging. Very challenging. Uh, and, and that was... Summed up, I guess, by school. So I was a bit, you know, okay, I know the, the family life and I know how that works and how we all get on, but the rest of this business, the rest of this world, it's befuddling. This place and what was in it was a filter for me, a um, filter for the world and a place of refuge. <clears throat> anyway... Mum explained to me, or someone explained to me, that the whole thing, I had, didn't have to read the whole thing. That was a great relief. Because <laughs> I could tell, just by looking, that there was going to be a lot of books in there that had no interest. They held no interest for me. There were books about cookery, for example. There were going to be books about carpentry. Neither of those things have ever found any hook uh, for me. But I, I also, f- also knew not knowing, but also knew that there was probably stuff in there that I've never heard of, probably called history or or, or poetry, that were going to engage me for the rest of my life. But I didn't have to worry about that because there was a corner of the library for little people. 
like me. So I was guided into this corner. And yeah, I could see all the uh, hardback, large format books that I was used to from my home and mum reading us picture books. But I burrowed through that corner of the, of, the, of the library. Look, if the library, if this corner of the library was one-sixth, I reckon, of the entire place, I kept burrowing and burrowing until I located, if we imagine spines here, a little mountain range of books, of spines, that altogether were to galvanise my imagination and life for the rest of um, time. So, this was the first, this was a, one of the peaks of that mountain range, because the books were taller, right? So one of the peaks was the Tintin series. And Tintin was possibly the first moment of that little area of, of, of the library, maybe it was a one thousandth, no, I think it was, yeah, I think it was one thousandth of the children's area, which in itself was one sixth of the entire area. So I think it was one six thousandth of the, of the library that I'd come across. And this mountain range was my mountain range. It formed me, I climbed it, we collaborated. So this guy uh, taught me, taught me, he, he, all those books, there's 23 books in the Asterix series, uh, the Tintin series, by Hergé, Georges Rémy, the Belgian. Not that I knew that then, they're all in English, as far as I know, they were published in you know, Fitzroy. What do I know? Nothing. Uh, gloriously, nothing. And, uh, but the, the clear line, the lignée claire of Urge, Urge was, is still in my, in my body as a, as a platonic ideal of what comics can be uh, and, 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 and show. And the Tintin, this guy here, this guy here, Asterix by René Goscinny and Albert Udezo, uh, this is a different world, but it's still comics, and you, you, you chuck a whole lot of Romans. These Romans are crazy. Uh, you fight against the Romans. It's very, very excellent. Bless you, bless you, bless you. There's a, so there's a lot, and, and you know, you can't count the number of, you can't actually count the number of Asterix books. There's always another one coming. Even, even, even Asterix uh, having stopped being produced by Albert Udezo, the, the original artist, now they've got these, these young bucks uh, taking it on, producing more, more stories. It's never going to end. So those are really important. These comics. The pictures and the words, as in an illustrated book, don't have to sort of have a horizon line between them. They can be mushed in and squished together. Very liberating. The other books in this ridge line with these ones very funny series of books uh, I haven't read one in, a, in about 30 years but the, the adventure books so Willard Price is a I think he's Canadian actually was Canadian but he wrote this series of books Volcano Adventure South Sea Adventure this is the first one I read Gorilla Adventure were there 10 were there 50 I cannot remember but uh, they were also illustrated but you know single spot illustrations throughout uh, they, they concerned the adventures of Hal and Roger Hunt. Hal, perpetually 19. Roger, always 15. Uh, working for their dad, who ran a, ran a private zoo on Long Island. <laughs> <laughs> they travelled the world, captured animals, and I think for me, this, this series really imbued me with the sense of some sort of uh, um, sympathy for animals, but no empathy. Uh, I, don't, I don't get the animal world, I don't understand it, but I really like it when you know, a, a gorilla can jump at you out of the underbrush and scare you. Um, so that was another formative... I'd just like to note at this point too that this is whatever it is, the early 1970s, all of these books, they're all, they're all hardback, hardbacks, hardbacks, something in that uh, physical structure. The, other, the last, or the second last series of books was uh, the Swallows and Amazons series by uh, Arthur Ransom. Uh, Arthur Ransom, so the, 
we've got these young English, very chipper young people uh, having adventures on the lakes uh, in their little boats. That's the swallow taking off. Is one of the very early pictures from the book Swallows and Amazon. And maybe there's 10 books in the Swallows and Amazon series. The start of the voyage, this reads. And when it was originally published, they were published with pictures not by Arthur Ransom. And he wasn't happy. So he said, let me illustrate them. And the publisher, I'm making this up, said, but Mr. Ransom, you can't draw. <laughs> and he said, no, but I know that country. And so famously, in the Swallows and Amazons pictures, almost always people have their backs to you. He's a bit uncomfortable about the faces sort of thing. <laughs> but they, those pictures, as naive as they are, give unto the text this, this uh, texture, which is, which is part of the, I say, part of the writing of those books. So part of the writing of those books is the pictures that are scattered uh, uh, throughout. Look at that chin. It's magnificent. Uh, um, so I'm burrowing through these books. So they're all adventure series, yeah? There's the Swallows and Amazons and the Tintin and the Asterix and the... And the um, what's the other one I mentioned? Dang, the Gorillas. The adventure books. Great adventures, all of them. We're daring do, we're getting around, we're messing it up, we're, 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 we're engaging with the world. They're adventurous books. They're all written by blokes, which is fine by me. But there was another book to be found in that section of the library. There was another book that completed that mountain range. Another series of books. Oh! And these didn't, they fit into the mountain range. They definitely fit in them because it was my mountain range. They definitely fitted into it. Uh... And Daniel Schlusser, I've got your copy here today, so I'll give it back to you after about 15 years. <laughs> but these books were very mysterious. Um, this is a few books into the series. Uh, again, we've got the hardbacks. There's a colour cover, of course, but within there are spot illustrations by, well, as I first thought, Tove Jansen. Who is this bloke called Tove, I thought to myself, when I finally got to wondering about authors. And Tove Janssen is a woman. And I, I, can't, I couldn't find a picture of the back covers of those early... Uh, the, Dan has a different one on his back cover. But on my back covers, back at Northcote Library, there was an amazing picture. Just had a woman photographed from behind, standing on a series of rocks looking out to sea. And the biography was something like, Tuva Jansen lives on an archipelago of islands in the Gulf of Finland. Full stop. <laughs> Astonishing. She wasn't even looking at you. I, I, I didn't even know. Maybe I did say, I don't know. It was just a man for a long time, and a long time in my mind. And she's looking out. It was not... Uh... So in those books... You meet Moomin Troll, the main character. And trolls, you know, are part of the Teutonic mythology world. They are, in fact, dwarves. Uh, they live underground. They're supposed to be uh, uh, misshapen and ugly. But Tuva Janssen, these are her trolls. And they're sort of a bit furry. I've always thought of them as being about that high. But we could have a little bit of a survey later on. And do that. Who, who thinks... <laughs> Smaller. You're going down here. Yeah. No. <laughs> and so how big Snufkin? Same size? Choo! The arm wrestles. Brilliant. So here's, here's, uh, here's Moomin Troll. Um, and this image... So I think that Tuva makes images which are, lend themselves to iconic... Uh, to an iconic quality. That, now, that has to do with her, the clarity of her line which is limpid, 
uh, beyond belief. She's a great cartoonist. Kind of the Moomin books or the Moomin characters were transformed into a comic strip at one point. She made a, about five years. She did a comic strip, Moomin comic strip. But these pictures turn up in the text like... Um, they, they, they anchor the text, uh, and here we have... Look at the hands of this Moomin here. Look at his eyes. And overwhelmingly, for me, as a, as a, as a, as a kid, uh, and now, uh, what I find in the books is the, the characters removing themselves from the rest of... The, I mean, they live in a really, really good world. Moomin Valley. Uh, there's Moomin Mama. Moomin Mama, not having her pearls on in this particular picture, but always the handbag. Always the handbag in which anything can be found. Uh, uh, here we are, shipwrecked. But we're, we're, we're the, um, the Moomins, so we're not really shipwrecked, but we're, we're, on a flo we're in a floating theatre. <laughs> Magnificent. And, and, and they don't know what theatre is, these, these Moomins. They have to be taught by Emma, the, um, the terrible, bad-tempered uh, uh, stage manager. There's great amounts of uh, bad-temperedness. In, in does, that, does that mean three minutes to go? That, that thing of 20. Of, wow, I've got to speed this up. Uh, there's Moom and Mama. Here's Moom and Papa in the Hobgoblin's hat. The Hobgoblin's hat. Now, uh, out of the Hobgoblin's hat, all sorts of... Uh, if, you, if, you put, if you put some eggshells in the Hobgoblin's hat, clouds will come out. Uh, if you put a dictionary of... Um, Unprintable words? Unpronounceable words? Sorry? Thank you. Outlandish words? On top of the, uh, the uh, hobgoblin's hat, little creatures crawl out. The outlandish words become little animals. There's, luckily, uh, Moomin Papa, he will take this off pretty soon, which will mean that he'll only get a slight headache and that'll be over before dinner time. Because it's a transformative hat, the uh, hobgoblin's hat. His snuffkin. He's a sort of a mate of a... Sniff, 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 sorry. Oh, God. Sniff, his sniff, who is, um, who is a mate of, of, uh, of Moomin Trolls, but he's very avaricious. You know, he's a, he, lo loves, he, loves, he loves money. He's a Hemulin. This Hemulin um, is a bloke, but he's wearing a dress, uh, which is the sort of thing that Hemulins do. Uh, and up here is, that's, this is a moomin troll, and up here is the snork maiden, who's sort of his girlfriend, I guess. The idea that you might have a girlfriend was um, totally foreign to me at the age of seven, but it was a very good, they had a really nice relationship. So the Hemulin's sad, uh, and the uh, moomin trolls are trying to cheer him up here. For me, the books uh, had most impact on me when I came across this book, Moomin Troll Midwinter, Moomin Land Midwinter in English, maybe Moomin Land Midwinter. This is, of course, the original Swedish version, Troll Winter, I guess. And in it, um, so your Moomin, you've got to understand that Moomins, um, they hibernate over winter. So they, they go into the Moomin house and they eat a big meal of pine needles and then they sleep, they winter through, and they wake up uh, when spring comes. But this particular winter, Moomin Troll here, he, uh, he wakes up midwinter, and he walks out into a strange and unrecognizable world. You know, his, his Moomin Valley is covered in a white blanket of snow, and he, uh, he's, I think, lonely, um, and... Not only is the physical landscape changed, but also his social landscape is totally um, transformed. And, and I, I'd love the Moomin books, but this one uh, impacted on my surface. It cratered uh, and gave me a model. This is, that's which is a very, very clumsy word. 
It gave me a, an inkling, I suppose, of how you can be alone uh, and uh, unsure, but keep on going and explore. That's what I think. Maybe that's what this book, this book gave me. And and, and so for me, the whole Moomin world is a very uh, important one. But this book is the centre of that of that impact. Where are we? Oh yeah, right. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think we should turn over to questions. I think we should. I've got some other things to say, but maybe we can work them into the the blah blah blah. Uh, but so this. So yeah. So I'd like to. Wrap there by saying that this, this book, of all the Moomin books, uh, is the most important for, to me. I'd also like to say that uh, Moomin's, you can buy Moomin cups, of course, you can buy a Moomin video um, now, but my argument to you, my suggestion to you, my provocation to you is that only giving a child the books, hardback preferably, will give them a key, such as it's given me and, and continues to be a key, to understand reality, to understand the world. Uh, and that's what uh, these books gave to me. Does anybody have any questions, uh, comments, uh, uh, criticisms? <laughs> yes? How, just that last sentence, how is it, this is 40 years ago. Yes. It continues to be a key. So how does, it, how does this continue to be a key over the last 40 years? It continues to be a key because I think Janssen has this magic about her where she's <clears throat> got these books, very, a, a very child world in, uh, or books for children. But then uh, she also writes books, apart from this series, which is about her life, or more autobiographical stories, but more, you know, the humans uh, in them. Um, and I don't... Technically, those books are for children and those books are for adults. But what I experience when I read the Moomins, the, these books, is that they still um, give me pointers about, particularly about diversity. She was, like the, the Moomin house is a very open one. Uh, and about difficulty. Right? Things are difficult, of course they are, um, in the world. Um, but the way that people deal with, the way that these people deal with difficulty in Moomin Land, for me as a guide. So for me, I think there are books that you read and there are books that you believe. Um, and uh, for me, these are these are books, books, books to believe. Mm, thank you. Yes. But you did sort of raise the question in the title of the seminar in this presentation. What has it taught you? Is there an answer to what it teaches us about sadness in the Moomin Troll world? I'm just oh. curious. For me, for me, it was so. For me, these, these books are not the tricky. We're about talking about melancholy and the Moomins because it's not. Re it's really a tiny sliver of the world of the Moomins, of course. So what they do is they present an entire very, very, variable world with great people, uh, creatures in it, of which sadness is an important part of the emotional ecology of each of those people. Um, so it's not a single issue book, you know, it's not we're going to tackle sadness or, you know, um, being bullied or anything like that in these books. Um, but she's, una either, I, reckon, I, I say Tuva, Janssen is unafraid, for unaf some reason, for some reason she's, I mean, she was a m daughter of a, a sculptor and a, an illustrator. Uh, she, I always thought she lived on that island by herself. No, she lived with this woman, they had this lovely relationship, or great, relate, lovely, great relationship for, what, 40 years or something like that. Um, she, I think she's tough uh, about, that, about that stuff and gentle. So... Those two things. How did you go when you reread re them when you were 21? Was it just looking back to when you were seven, or was, would they also reconnect to your 21 year old self? How did that go? Yeah, definitely. I yeah. guess um, obviously I brought a whole new perspective to them. I yeah. don't know why I suddenly picked them up and reread the whole series, but I did. As I said, I was ill in bed, and for some reason I got my hands on these. And well, they are. Exqu I mean, that's the other point. They are exquisitely written, and I guess mm. exquisitely translated. Mm. Of course. So I guess totally different perspective. Um, I do think there's something adult about them. Mm. 
even when you're a child that you yeah. picked up. I think like a cartoon, when you look back now at the old-fashioned cartoons and you think, oh, they were really quite adult, actually, yeah. in the sense of humour. Maybe not so much anymore because you're not allowed to be. But, um, yeah, just, um, just more subtleties, more subtleties like those, you know, those emotions and so forth. It's an interesting question about the question of adult as well. Like, you know, mm. so adult clearly for us is a, now is a, is a, um, a shorthand uh, for rude or violent or something like that. Uh, for, for me, the adult quality of the Moomin Troll books is the, the depth and the breadth of the emotional uh, um, range of the characters. Yeah. And I think it's interesting, all the cranky, grumpy ones. You're, yeah. you know, there are some that are just, you know, I forget the name, but always cranky, always grumpy. Sure. Anyone else at the back? Yes, here. I'll, I'll try and turn this into a question. <laughs> uh, over the course of the, the Moomin Troll books, uh, there's some pretty... Um, vicious uh, social satire. You've got characters like the Hemulans who are kind of the negative side of the public service. <laughs> yeah, the police. Very conservative. Yeah, the, yeah. Yeah, and, and, uh, and the, um, the philijonks, the yep. d too afraid to, to, do, to live yes. um, characters. There are a couple of books where you kind of, I get the sense that she started out to write a Moomin Troll book and couldn't find them. And so the book ended up being about not being able to find the Moomin Trolls. I'm making that up. I love it. I'm making that up. But the, the, the story where I think it's Toffle wakes up and he goes to find the Moomins and the house is empty. <laughs> and it's just this massive journey to find them and the house is yeah. empty. And, and also the bleakness of the big adventure to the, um, the lighthouse yeah. and kind of nothing happens. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, what's your experience of that as an artist... Uh, you got to write something and... Sure, sure. Well, I, I think I, I nerve out at that point and go, I'm going to make something up. Clearly, you're making stuff up all the time, but you freak out and you go, I've got to... I've got to something interesting has got to happen here. But the bravery of, of, of Janssen is, I'm, I've, I've got there. You know, it's, it's like the process, you know, I'm going to... She trusts, you know, and maybe that's from being in a, an artist world growing up. But she really, really, I feel... I haven't read her biography, you know, that came out a couple of years ago. It sounds really good, but, you know, she just sounds like she just really trusts that she, whatever she's going to get to. That's, and, but why can she do that and still give me satisfaction? That's my question of Tova Janssen. Annoying woman. Because she's telling the truth. Because she's, yeah. she's, yeah. she's telling the truth, I reckon. Mm. Mm. Yes. Yeah, I guess with coming off that idea of telling the truth and also the adult child elements I think it's I do like the fact that they don't hold back I guess because sometimes a lot of the new kids books they sort of deliberately don't include the truth in yeah. a way they can be that and there is that strong distinction between adult kids or young adult and the, the idea that kids or young adult books can't be intellectual or can't be smart I guess and I do like that about the movements that there is that like real real life there yeah and yeah. so uh, yeah I guess that wasn't really a question. No, it's nice. Thank yeah. you. Daniel Schlosser. Um, I, I think the um, observations about the the way that Tove yet lets um, sort of antisocial and unsociable elements in ourselves be stated without criticism or comment. People are allowed to be either very sad or sadistic or... Um, so shy they disappear um, I just wanted to ask you if you would maybe bring it back a bit to your mountain um, and just invite a comparison between those sorts of uh, heroes like Tintin and Asterix who, those worlds as fabulous as they are tend to rely on you being that hero yes. um, and I just wondered if you wanted to I, so I th yeah that. I think thanks Dan so I think but for me, these books were the... Were the I, I mean, I love adventure stories and, 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 and heroes. I love them. Um, but this, these books... It doesn't sound like they're putting them in opposition, but they were a corrective to uh, the sense that, oh, man, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a coward, or I'm, um, um, I'm too um, upset to tackle this particular issue or problem. Um, so her, her generosity and the generosity of that, of that social setting, of the Moomin Valley, 
we also cruel and, you know, they, they like to tease each other. And, and, but uh, it just got, I think it gave me a larger, not even, even emotional, I think a larger moral world. Uh, you know, again, heroes and adventures are, are, are great, but they're a bit pointy. Uh, you know, this is a, a larger uh, array. And again, that, 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 break, uh, the, that just allowing yourself to follow something down to, the, to, the, to, the, to wherever it leads you, rather than, I know that third act, we need a battle with Darth Vader, uh, <laughs> you know, um, so maybe you know one. Maybe my course, maybe that is is sort of how do how do you how do you bridge those those things or allow one within the other? Ugh, sounds a bit wishy washy. I should be okay about that, shouldn't I? Yeah. <laughs> Security of the family, definitely the Moomin. Yeah. People really come into that household very openly, openly, open house. And that chimed with me as well about my childhood and, and in continuing family home. It's very, very much that. One more question up the back, is yeah. that right? Yeah. yeah. Thanks very much for your talk. It would be really nice if we could just sit here for the afternoon <laughs> and look at Moomin pictures. But um, I read the books when I was little and I'm sort of in my early 40s now and they always really stayed with me. But two of the characters in particular that stayed with me were uh, Snufkin and, and Little Mai, and I mean, Snufkin was this sort of fiercely independent, sort of um, a bit hard to understand, you know, as a character. And Little Mai was kind of just absolutely mad and really <laughs> wonderful. And I'm I'm interested to know sort of your thoughts on them, and you know where they sit in the Moomin universe, but also kind of what they represent for kids reading the books and the kind of um, I guess archetypes they represent yeah. you know, for children. Yeah, certainly, okay, so I've got a Snufkin story, which is, you know, I'm preparing for this, and oh, it's great, you know, rereading, and, and that discovered to my sort of joy and sort of terror uh, was that there was a bloke who Tov, Tuva was engaged to uh, when she was a student, uh, and that um, he was a great mind and a, and a, a very sort of out-adventuring out sort of person, and this entry or whatever it was on the web, you know, said, ah, this, you know, Tuva has said that he's the, he was the model for Snufkin. Or the, the. But, but for me, Snufkin, Snufkin and Moomintroll are almost this beautiful dyad, which, you know, I want to, now, today I'm Snufkin, you know, and I'm playing my harmonica by the, by the creek, and nobody owns me. And that's the great thing about, and that, he's got a beautiful, clear note about him, him, and then he goes. And Mumintrol is sad, as we saw before, because Snufkin's gone, and when will he ever come back? Um, so, th yeah, good, good shoes to, to, to be able to step into, I suppose, you know, fictionally. And little <laughs> my, she's just a gadfly, biting insect, hilariously funny. Uh, what's her sister, the Mimble? The sister's the Mimble is trying to take care of her, and little my's tiny, and she's just uh, bites people, and <laughs> she's just an annoying kid. Really annoying kid, uh, and there's a be that beautiful bit where she and Snufkin sort of have a little bit of a um, uh, an alliance, you know, which is really, really funny. So again, uh, Janssen allowing allowing these incredible uh, colours to play to play off each other. I'm just going to finish up. Um, uh, that's the Groke. Um, she was not particularly big. And didn't look dangerous either. But you felt that she was terribly evil and would wait forever. And that was awful. But I'm not going to finish on that, of course. That's a ridiculous thing. To oh, that's, that's Titus Groan from uh, that's, um, Mervyn Peak we didn't get to. But this is a picture of um, them sailing away from the Lonely Islands. I wonder what you're thinking of doing with the snork's gold, said Snufkin. I think we shall use it to decorate the edges of the flower beds, said Moom and Mama. Only the big bits, of course, because the little ones look so rubbishy. <laughs> then in silence, they watched the sun dive into the sea and the colours fade from blue, sorry, to blue and violet, while the adventure rocked gently homeward. Thank you. Thank you.
Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.